Hey, welcome back to Game Brain. My name's Don. Ever since Spider-Man 2 web swings onto the scene, open world superhero games have steadily become one of the most popular genres around, and of the handful of original series that have come out of this recent boom, Prototype is one of the best, combining equal parts parkour, earth-shattering combat, and gruesome body horror. It's an open world playground that's held up remarkably well over a decade since release. It really makes you wonder how its developer, Radical Entertainment, went from making Simpsons and Incredible Hulk games to making, well, this. To get a better understanding of how Radical transitioned from licensed games to creating an adult-rated sandbox slaughterhouse, we're going to chat to Eric Holmes, who was the lead designer on Prototype and the two Incredible Hulk games that came before it. These games have a lot in common and were primarily made by the same team at Radical, one after the other. And it's always fascinated me how each game took what worked in their previous title and grafted it onto the new one, while adding a bunch of new stuff on top of it. So, Eric got his start in the industry way back in 1997, working for Viz Interactive on the 3D debut of Earthworm Jim. He later landed at EA Canada in Vancouver, working on a winter sport racing game called Sledstorm, but he wasn't that enthusiastic about it at the time. I found myself on a snowmobile racing game at Electronic Arts Canada. My passion was, was to make great games, but it wasn't really to make snowmobile racing games. Uh, you're talking to a guy who'd never seen a snowmobile before he found himself on a game about them. My passion was always action games. That was the thing I wanted to do. And certainly at the time, I was very much about third person action games. And soon enough, Eric would be able to fulfill his dream of working on a big third person action game when he got picked up by Radical Entertainment as a designer, where a tie-in game with Ang Lee's 2003 Hulk movie had just been pitched and commissioned for the studio to start work on. So this was a big boom period in Radical's history, right? Coming off other successful licensed games like Jackie Chan's Stuntmaster and The Simpsons Road Rage. Anyway, Eric was named Design Director for the Hulk tie-in and began work alongside many of the devs who'd worked on Stuntmaster. And from day one, he and the team had a clear focus of how this was all going to go down. The combat system for Hulk was uh, driven from one idea, which is power, um, because that is the thing that is synonymous with the Hulk. He's, he's the strongest one there is, right? So how do we, how do we transfer that into, into a game and make that fun? One of the things you'd notice if you look at the game, both the Hulk 2003 game and the Hulk Ultimate Destruction, was holding down a button to add power to a move. Uh, that was something that was shamelessly inspired by Devil May Cry. Uh, and in the original Devil May Cry game, there was a, a weapon called the Ifrit Gloves. And the Ifrit Gloves was the first game I played, at least that I can remember, which had the hold down for power idea. And I loved what they did in that game with it. So you hold down the button, you're gonna go further with your blow, you're going to hit harder and you'll be more powerful. At release, Hulk reviewed way above expectations and despite some questionable stealth sequences, it was clear the well-rounded and powerful combat was a strong enough foundation to set the stage for a new, original Hulk game. Radical had also just released The Simpsons Hit and Run, probably their fan favourite game all these years later, which at the time proved without a shadow of a doubt that this new open world trend wasn't going away anytime soon. So there's a pretty dark time I remember of trying to finish Hulk, but also trying to think about what we would do next. The thing that is most clear in my memory there is Radical was going through, and, and I think the whole industry, if you look at what, what was happening, you know, if you looked at the shelves and the charts, if you look between 2001 and 2005, open world games were exploding, right? They were becoming a thing. And GTA 3, I think it really they'd come out and just blown the doors off, right? And it was the game. And if I remember right as well, Treyarch had already come out with Amazing Spider-Man. No, sorry, it wasn't Amazing Spider-Man. It was Spider-Man 2. And they had done an open world superhero game. And that was also an inspiring part of things. So we looked at that game and we're like, damn, we have to, we have to up our game. We have to be like that. That's where things are going. Yeah, I think, I think open world was basically in the air. So, for example, uh, on Hulk Ultimate Destruction, one of the pillars on there was action on the Richter scale. And if you think about that, 
that is a really great tool because it tells you what's in and what's out on so many things. It tells you what sort of levels you're going to have. It tells you what sort of mechanical moves you're going to have. It tells you uh, what you're not going to do. You're not going to have uh, one of the examples that, that would come up would be people putting in suggestions for, hey, can we have a mission where Hulk saves a kitten from a tree? And then you could look at the pillars and go, action on the Richter scale. Well, it doesn't doesn't look like we can have it because that rules it out. That says you can have a you can have a mission where you knock a building down, or you destroy a, a column of tanks, or uh, you blow up an entire military base. But the kitten in the tree doesn't pass the test, so he's not in, and the tanks are. But somehow the idea of him bashing everything out of the way came up. And since we had, I'd mentioned that Radical had good physics tech, this was a thing we were excited about doing. So in 2003's Hulk, there was a lot of objects you could pick up and you could throw them and they would get launched at things and they would smash against them and then they would kind of come to rest on the ground. And so the idea with going to an open world would be, well, there's going to be lots of cars in there and they're 3D objects that can be bounced around just like that too. But if you run down a street, you don't want to stop. You want to keep going because you're the Hulk. And uh, I'd mentioned those pillars earlier before. I think it kind of came after we'd done some experiments, but the pillar for Hulk's movement was unstoppable movement. I can still remember the team meeting where we showed Hulk jumping super high over the city, doing air dashes, and then smashing a helicopter in the air, running in software, and there was gasps around the room of, holy crap, we can do that? Oh man, we've got something. I think before that, there was probably people going, how are you going to do that? And then after that, there was like, oh man, I can't wait to build around that. And so that was a big tipping point for the project. As Ultimate Destruction's environments got bigger and bigger thanks to the new technology at Radical, they were also overhauling how creating combat worked. Eric says that while making Hulk, developers would have to wait many minutes at a time to make even the slightest adjustment to a new move that was being created. But thanks to some streamlined and more powerful tools, developers could now make small tweaks to Hulk's huge arsenal of attacks in just a fraction of the time. And Eric says this substantially faster iteration speed was like pouring gasoline on an already raging creative fire. Uh, how does that reflect to the moveset? It meant that it got pretty cool pretty quickly. And we also got addicted to the excitement of adding cool new things. What are we going to add tomorrow? And it was just this crackle of excitement of amazing new things turning up all the time. That was magical as a developer. Like you, you just, you, when you get into a groove and things are just better than any one person can imagine because the animators are producing gold, the developers working on the, the motion scripting are, 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 are killing it, and it's going into levels where people are getting really excited about building encounters for it. So it's it's a, a lot of developers from Radical and Ultimate Destruction team have great memories of that. The weaponization came out of, well, he's, he's strong and he's powerful, but he's pretty clever like a fox in the way that he does things, and that he can leverage his unique abilities to do the things you wouldn't think he could do. You know, he's not gonna split the atom, but, he is going to maybe surprise you in a way that he can do things, so he's resourceful. After Ultimate Destruction became a smash hit, the team at Radical were then tossing up a handful of concepts and ideas for what their next game could be. An early idea that gained favour was an Ultimate Avengers game, inspired by the Ultimate comic line rebooted by Marvel in 2000. But the concept never fully took shape before another idea infected the team's minds. After spending nearly five years making only Hulk games, this new concept of a shape-shifting monster was starting to mutate and grow within Radical's ranks. But the thing I remember most clearly about Prototype was that was the concept that let us have a character that could do anything and he was extremely expandable. So when we first started con conceiving of that game, the kind of core inspiration of that was The Thing, as in John Carpenter's The Thing. This is a character that you could literally explore gameplay at a cellular level. You could be in a, in a world where you are cells gobbling each other on a plate under a microscope. And then you could potentially jump off the plate of the microscope and become uh, an insect or a rodent and then work your way up to humanity. And then you could keep going. You could go up to Godzilla size if you want to build giant monsters, which we focused on mainly for the enemies. But as a concept, suddenly the axes of everything you could do just exploded with that character. Hulk in a way is super bound. Like he's not gonna do math. He's not gonna drive a tank. He's not gonna be subtle. He's not gonna sneak or lie to someone. He's gonna just 
power through everything. That's what he does. And this was kind of an antidote to that. It was like, wow, you, well, you could play like the Hulk if you wanted to, but you could also be extremely subtle and complicated and big and small and human and do all sorts of things we couldn't do. So I think I think the kind of breaking off the chains of the Hulk was also an appealing part of that. We Suddenly the things that were off the table were, were on the table and that let us do, uh, at least conceptually, think of new things to do. With the new lead character in the form of anti-hero Alex Mercer, Eric and the team began carving out a creative and gruesome new moveset, albeit one that was obviously influenced a lot by what they'd done previously in Ultimate Destruction. The main point of difference was Mercer's many new powers, like razor-sharp claws, a huge blade, and crowd-clearing whip fists. What basically began as weaponization in Ultimate Destruction became full-blown body horror transformation in Prototype. Players could also now commandeer tanks, helicopters, and shapeshift so they could blend in with crowds and stealthily sneak into military bases to acquire upgrades. And for all the incredible systemic destruction of Prototype, where at any one time so much carnage and chaos could be unfolding, Eric says the biggest challenge for most of the design team was getting the social stealth mechanics to work when interacting around NPC AI. For example, coming up with a metric of how far away can a guy tell you are a monster if you jump from 50 stories down and right in front of him? If it's six inches away, clearly he's going to be upset. <laughs> and he's going to go, what the fuck was that? And if it's a meter away, what's he going to say to that? If it's 10 meters away, if it's 50 meters away, this is 100 meters away, what point does that cutoff happen? Somewhere in between there, you need thematic immersion, but you also need gameplay that feels fun and it doesn't feel like you're surrounded by a bunch of people who are grassing you up to the police all the time. But the communication of how the rules of the game will work uh, and making it feel immersive, that was super tricky in this game. Because we have a character that moves so quick and sometimes you can just press a button and do this enormously big action that should clearly out you to people. Like just the way Alex jumps is like, clearly it's not human, right? Clearly it is nothing to do with regular human level. But the moment you started doing that around people, if everyone opens fire, the moment you do a, a small, perhaps accidental sprint input or something like that, it, it's not fun. So the, just the connecting of those two things was a real, I think a real struggle for the team. And it certainly wasn't cheap or easy. It was uh, expensive, complicated, and as successful as we could make it with the time that we had. It's interesting in a game with so much chaos, so much action and all of these different moves going on at once, that the most difficult thing would end up being the bit where you slow down and are interacting with sort of NPCs. And I guess in that sense that the team sort of mastered that chaos by that point and it was those finer things that were causing more problems. In a game, the expensive and risky thing is mostly the face. <laughs> and I know that sounds counterintuitive, but trying to get a close-up of a face in a game that looks real and human and that you believe in the effort, amount of effort required by that is massive because we are used as users to seeing faces and identifying them and understanding and reading them how they work. Whereas um, in, for example, prototype, having a helicopter crash into a street, smash into traffic, traffic blows up, people run chaotically, the cars catch fire. Once you've done that once in a systemic sense, it's kind of free after that and it, and it just works. Whereas subtle, up close character interactions and people communicating wasn't. I think we struggled with it. Also, not just struggled with it, but I think struggled to make it as cool because the payoff of someone communicating to you in terms of like, hey, it's it's that guy, get him. And then maybe you use the patsy move and like wave it off onto someone else is not as immediately obviously as cool as an Apache gunship crashing into Times Square wrapping your head around it, delivering it in a compelling way, and then trying to make it part of a game loop. It was, it was, it was more uncharted territory for us and, and probably a lower return on the time spent. But like, that team had to work hard to make, to make it get to where it got to. When Prototype released, it reviewed pretty well and sold more than 2 million units. A team that first worked on a linear stealth action movie tie-in had made the jump to open world mayhem with a laser focus on all that action, only to take that chaos to its breaking point and come back around to some of the stealthier design principles. 
It prompted an immediate sequel that didn't sell or review nearly as well as the first, and only a few months later, Radical Entertainment was effectively closed by Activision. But Eric wasn't at the studio when all this happened. He'd left the team at the end of Prototype's development and continued his journey through the industry, working at Epic Games while they were first starting work on Fortnite, and then as the creative director on Batman Arkham Origins at Warner Brothers Games Montreal. These days, he works at Battlefield developer DICE, leading the design of the series' campaigns. To my surprise, Eric says he hasn't actually played Prototype since it first released more than a decade ago, and that it might never be possible to separate the game from its difficult development. Is there any one thing you're most proud of from, from working at Radical, and maybe just to get an understanding as well of, of what the studio meant to you, or, or like that time in your life in particular? Yeah, I think yeah, I think one thing that really stands out about Radical is, uh, I mean, I can't speak to the whole studio, but I can speak to our team, and I think our team was kind of internally described as a dysfunctional family. We were a bunch of people that didn't always get along and bumped against each other a fair bit, but I think the results were really, really great. And I think that whilst the process might not have always been the best, I think we always kind of punched above our weight. We were a relatively small team. So I, I think there was, a, there was a real spirit there of kind of being the underdog, a, a real desire to uh, constantly push ourselves and outdo ourselves. And I, I think that spirit served us really well. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching this video. I hope you liked it. Feel free to give the video a like if you did. That's helpful, I suppose. And if you're not already subscribed and you'd like to see more from me in the future, that is also a thing that you can do. But if you have any suggestions for any other games, mechanics, or levels you'd like me to investigate in future videos, please leave a suggestion in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you and what you would like to see in other future videos, I suppose. If you have another 20 minutes of your time to spare, why don't you also check out my short documentary on the making of Middle-earth Shadow of Mordor's Nemesis system. It's fine. Until next time, see ya.